one more time greetings and uh, welcome to our discussion of modern European Christianity. As we go forward, we're going to look at theologians and churchmen who have a more positive outlook on uh, scripture, the church, and Christianity. We'll begin with Soren Kierkegaard, who was a Danish Lutheran. All right, so he grew up, was baptized in the Lutheran church. He was the son of a wealthy wool merchant, so he was um, uh, wealthy himself, but he had an unhappy childhood, and at one point he broke his engagement uh, with a young lady because of his devotion to the church, and this had a very serious impact on the rest of his life and ministry. He trained for ministry, but never took ordination. He was a philosophical and religious writer who critiqued the Lutheran state church. In other words, he looked at the union of the, uh, the, the state with the Lutheran church in Denmark, and he was critical of this relationship. He is considered the father of Christian existentialism. Let's see how this existentialism worked out in his life and thought. He taught that a Christian must be willing to pay the price, not just to belong to the church. It required more than infant baptism in order to be a true Christian. He considered the union of church and state, this uh, membership by infant baptism, to be mere Christendom. And he said this is the enemy of Christianity. And so uh, he attacked da the Danish state church, which he viewed as complacent and formalistic. He taught that the New Testament demands a vital, personal commitment of obedience, not the insipid formalism that was present in uh, Kierkegaard's day. And so we would agree with much of what Kierkegaard says here. And this is a warning against the union of church and state. And we can see how it, it just uh, uh, drained the life out of true Christianity. And I think the term mere Christendom is an, a, a very valid description of the union of church and state. He taught that if people found out that Christianity is not true, they wouldn't be too disappointed because they had not invested heavily into it. He called this cheap Christianity. And making Christianity easy was the crime of Christendom. In other words, being baptized into the church, having your name on the uh, church rolls, uh, was regarded as all one needed. But for Kierkegaard, this was mere Christendom. This was cheap Christianity. This was a crime. Kierkegaard emphasized risk and adventure uh, that Christianity should uh, fall outside of comfortable systems such as Hegel's philosophy and the state church. And so uh, Kierkegaard was very critical of Hegel's dialectic um, approach to philosophy. And this is where his existentialism comes in. Christianity is rooted in existence, therefore it is existential. The Christian discovers his or her identity through the pain of human existence. Kierkegaard's ideas influenced modern existential philosophers and also uh, influenced Karl Barth and the school of dialectical theologians, and he influenced Dietrich Bonhoeffer, as we shall see. Well, let's look at neo-orthodoxy and Karl Barth, uh, who is considered the father of neo-orthodoxy. So, he began his ministry as a pastor in Switzerland he was educated in liberal theology, studying under 
uh, such uh, theologians as Adolf Harnack. But after he pastored for 10 years, World War I erupted and Bart discovered that liberal theology does not work. He found that it was not effective in meeting the needs of his people and this uh, optimism about humanity simply uh, was refuted by the tragedy of World War and so he was forced to turn back to what he called the strange new world of the Bible. In 1919 he wrote his Roma brief, his commentary on the book of Romans. This writing was described as a bomb going off on the playground of the theologians. Remember, liberal theology dominated the universities, dominated the church. Liberal theology had really taken over the thought of Christendom in this era. But Bart found out it did not work, and so he returned to the Bible, specifically uh, the book of Romans, and uh, began to write on it and began to write uh, about uh, the Bible and wrote on truths from the Bible, uh, emphasizing the importance of Bible and its inspiration in our understanding of God. The themes of his Roma brief were the sovereignty of God, God's grace and revelation, human finiteness and sinfulness, no uh, naive optimism for Karl Barth. He had seen humanity in its reality and found it to be uh, sinful and finite. God, on the other hand, is wholly other. Uh, God is divine and uh, different, but real and uh, creator God. Christianity is not religion at all. It is God's sovereign and revealing word to which people can only respond. He went on to write his Church Dogmatics, a 13-volume systematic theology published in a 35-year period but never completed. He wrote about the doctrines of sin and redemption which had been ignored by the liberal theologians. They ignored the concept of redemption because they in ignored sin. Therefore, there was no need for redemption. He talked about the worthlessness of reason and said one must rely on revelation and faith. What a major step against uh, the philosophical and liberal theology of his day. He taught that Christ was the elect man, and there are those who believe that Bart uh, implied Christian universalism. And then he taught about the human and fallible character of Scripture, saying that the Bible contains God's Word. Now, here is where many will uh, disagree with Karl Barth. And there are many in our day who um, criticize him because he did not uh, go as far as we would like to in his orthodoxy. This is why we call his contribution Neo-Orthodoxy. Remember, Karl Barth is the father of Neo-Orthodoxy. All right? Remember that he is uh, ministering in a context of liberal theology where they have rejected the Bible completely. Uh, it is not divine revelation. It is simply a human book. Karl Barth wants to return to Scripture because he finds in Scripture uh, the, the true theology and the truth that enables us to have a relationship with God through our repentance and through redemption in Jesus Christ. But he has a very different understanding of inspiration than what uh, the Orthodox Christians normally hold. That is, we believe that the Bible uh, has uh, an inspiration in, in, embedded in its 
written form. In other words, inspiration is a miracle of the writing. And so the writing of the Bible is inspired, and the Bible is God's revelation. Now, Karl Barth considers inspiration to be a miracle of reading, and that is the reader finds inspiration within the scripture, and so the, uh, the Bible contains uh, God's revelation. Not all of it is God's revelation. It is God's revelation only when the reader is inspired to receive God's word. All right, so the Bible contains God's word, but not, it not, is not necessarily God's word in itself. I hope you see the distinction, and uh, we will disagree with Karl Barth at this level, but we need to appreciate Karl Barth based on his context, because he is returning people to the scripture to read it and find the inspiration that they need to live their daily lives and to find a relationship with God through redemption by Jesus Christ. So, he was a professor at Göttingen, Münster, and Bonn. And when the Nazis came to power and attempted to create a German Christian church, this union between Hitler and the Lutheran church, he was uh, in total opposition and founded the Confessing Church, the church that he believed to be the true church. And in 1934, he and others uh, signed the Barman Declaration. Bart authored it, others signed it, and this declaration supported the revelation of Jesus Christ against Hitler's propaganda and his national socialism. Because of his work in, uh, in supporting uh, Christian, uh, true Christianity, and his opposition against Hitler, in 1935 he was fired from his post at Bonn. He refused to swear allegiance to Hitler. Therefore, he traveled back to Switzerland and became a professor at Basel. In 1962, he visited America. There he was honored uh, as the man of the year and uh, also he traveled around and spoke to many different reporters. The story is told that one reporter asked him to summarize his theology, and Karl Barth answered, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Next, we're going to talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is a younger contemporary of Karl Barth. Also, Bonhoeffer was an ally with Barth in his confessing church. Uh, Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor in Germany and a teacher at the Berlin University. Bonhoeffer was born into a wealthy, upper-class very intellectual family. He was one of, I believe, 14 children. But at, uh, as a teenager, he declared to his family that he desired to be a theologian. This surprised everyone, but he felt like by studying God and teaching theology, he could make a difference in his world. And so he studied at the Berlin University uh, gained his PhD, uh, did some, uh, did a, an internship in Barcelona, and then became a teacher uh, at Berlin University. Now, in 1930 and 31, uh, he had a scholarship and an opportunity to study in America, and so he traveled to America in 1930 and 31. He, when he arrived there, he became very critical of American liberalism. In a letter he wrote back home to say uh, that uh, I have heard only one sermon 
in which you could hear something like a genuine proclamation. Uh, in New York, they preach about virtually everything. Only one thing is not addressed or is addressed so rarely that I have as yet been unable to hear it, namely the gospel of Jesus Christ, the cross, sin and forgiveness, death and life. As it turned out, uh, he became friends with an African American who invited him to the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, New York. And there, in the socially downtrodden African-American community, Bonhoeffer would finally hear the gospel preached and see its power manifested. All right, the pastor was uh, Dr. Adam Clayton Powell Sr. His son, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., would become the first black congressman from New York City. But in the Abyssinian Baptist Church, Bonhoeffer heard the gospel, uh, and he also fell in love with uh, uh, African-American spiritual music and jazz. He uh, was an avid piano player and would often play the piano in church, and he would teach children's Sunday school at this church. Here is a European scholar with a PhD teaching children's Sunday school. I love this story about uh, Bonhoeffer. It is said that the only real piety and power that Bonhoeffer saw in the American church seemed to be in the churches where there were a present reality and a past history of suffering. So this says a great deal about American Christianity uh, in the early 20th century. First, uh, liberal Christianity was dominant in Northern America, particularly in New York City, but also that the African American churches uh, were a place where the gospel was truly preached and experienced. By the way, I am reading from the biography of Bonhoeffer by Eric Metaxas, and I heartily recommend it to you uh, as a great source of information about Bonhoeffer and about uh, 20th century Christianity. Bonhoeffer, like Barth, was an early critic of Hitler and the Nazis, and as I said, he was active in the Confessing Church, in the ecumenical movement, and in the support of Jews. He also signed the Barman Declaration, and uh, in support of the Confessing Church, he began a he. Uh, became a teacher in the underground seminary. But when he supported uh, the Jews' escape from Germany, uh, he helped seven to escape, and when this action was discovered, he was arrested. I'm getting ahead of myself. In 1939, Bonhoeffer traveled to the United States for a lecture tour, but he decided that he must return to Germany and suffer with his people if he wanted to be a help to his people after the war. And so, when he returned to Germany, he became involved in a conspiracy to assassinate Hitler. If you perhaps have seen the movie Valkyrie, uh, this movie is about the organization with whom Bonhoeffer worked, but uh, his, uh, he was not portrayed in the movie because uh, this was during a time that he'd been arrested and was in prison, so he wasn't part of that story. But the question often is asked, how could a pacifist, a Christian ethicist 
become involved in a plot to murder a man, even someone as evil as Hitler. Bonhoeffer considers himself guilty of sin, but he believed that anyone who tolerated or ignored uh, the atrocities committed by Hitler was guilty of mass murder, and so he felt that assassination of Hitler was a lesser sin than uh, ignoring him and allowing him to continue. As I said, he aided seven Jews to escape from Germany, and for that reason, he was arrested. But later on, uh, his involvement in the assassination plot uh, was discovered, and so for that reason, uh, he was executed on April 9, 1945. Uh, just three weeks later, Hitler committed suicide, and on May 7th, the war in Europe was over. He was 39 years of age. He was engaged. His last words, this is the end, but for me, the beginning of life. Probably his best known work is The Cost of Discipleship, where he talks about cheap grace versus costly grace. Uh, perhaps you can see in this idea the influence from Kierkegaard. He wrote Life Together. This was the story of his work with the illegal underground seminary of the Confessing Church. While he was in prison, he wrote a book titled Ethics. This was incomplete, and it was published uh, after his death, even though he had expressly uh, requested that it not be published because of its radical statements, uh, perhaps uh, not thought all the way through and certainly not viewed from the aftermath of the war. But during this time of uh, persecution of the church, uh, he declared the church guilty of the deaths of the weakest and most defenseless brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And of course, he's talking about the Lutheran church that was united with Hitler and the Nazi party. Also, his letters and papers from prison have been published, and they are influential. So Bonhoeffer was a prolific writer whose influence is still felt today. All right, let's move across the channel to England and look at evangelical movements there. The Clapham sect was named after the parish church where they worshiped, and they emphasized the repeal of slavery, missionary work, Bible printing and distribution, Sunday school, and moral reform. One of their members uh, was William Wilberforce, who is a member of Parliament from 1784 to 1825, a 40-year uh, period of service. And Wilberforce was the leader of the uh, movement to abolish slavery in Britain. When he became a Christian, he, uh, he pondered whether to uh, abandon politics to uh, go into church ministry, but he was encouraged to remain in Parliament and to use his political influence to enact welfare and prison reform. There is a movie about William Wilberforce named Amazing Grace, and I recommend it as a biographical film. Next, let's talk about the Salvation Army, founded by William and Catherine Booth. Uh, in 1844, William was uh, converted in a Methodist New Connection Church. This is an evangelistic, Bible-believing movement uh, among the Methodists, and he became a pastor. But he resigned uh, when the church tried to restrict his work to one parish. All right, Just like uh, John Wesley, he felt that the world was his 
parish. And so he and his wife, Catherine, conducted an itinerant evangelistic ministry not confined to one parish. They opened the Christian mission in London, which was renamed the Salvation Army, which is famous today. All right. Uh, so they uh, they uh, composed orders and regulations. They had a band. They had uniforms. Uh, they traveled to America. And, of course, the Salvation Army is very prominent in America. In 1912, when William died, 16,000 officers had joined the Army. And uh, more recently, there were over 25,000 officers, 14,000 corps worldwide. So uh, you'll want to remember that William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. Plymouth Brethren was a, uh, was a kind of a deno denomination or at least a, uh, a, a, a society that developed uh, t uh, around 1830 formed by John Nelson Darby. Uh, his teachings combined Calvinism, pietism, and strong expectations of the millennium. You see the uh, list of beliefs there, but most important is the last one, dispensational premillennial eschatology. It was John Nelson Darby who introduced the concept of the rapture. So the rapture is a relatively uh, new doctrine, less than 200 years old. All right, next let's talk about Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was the foremost Baptist preacher of his age, known as the Prince of Preachers. He was raised in a family of uh, dissenters, uh, very religious, and uh, he tells the story of his personal conversion experience. When he talks about going to find a church uh, one uh, January uh, Sunday morning uh, during a snowstorm, as he was traveling through the street, uh, the snow was so deep, the blizzard was so heavy, he could not see. He couldn't go any further. But he turned down a street and he found a little primitive Methodist chapel. In that chapel, there might be uh, a 12 or 15 very faithful people. The minister himself could not come because of the snowstorm. And so in his place was preaching a shoemaker all right again we see a shoe salesman in the story of church history i love it but this shoemaker was a lay preacher who entered the pulpit to preach he was obliged to stick to the text because after all uh this uh, the, this was a liturgical service and the text was isaiah 45 22 which reads, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. And so, as the very simple lay preacher preached, he had very little exposition, but he said, My dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, Look. Now, that doesn't take much effort. Uh, you ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It just says, look. And so then he began to uh, look around among his audience, and he found a stranger, someone new. And he pointed his finger to Spurgeon and said, young man, you look very miserable. Spurgeon said, well, indeed I did. Um, but he didn't expect such personal remarks. Uh, he said, uh, you will always be miserable, miserable in life and miserable in death if you do not obey my text. But if you obey now, you will be saved. And he shouted, uh, according to Spurgeon, as only a primitive Methodist can, young man, look to Jesus Christ. Uh, look to Jesus Christ. And so uh, Spurgeon said that he obeyed. He looked to Jesus Christ. He was saved. And of course, the rest is history. 
He became the pastor of a small church and then was called to Park Street Baptist Church in London. In 1861, he built a new church uh, called Metropolitan Tabernacle, one of the earliest mega churches in church history. He also formed Spurgeon College for training ministers. He was a strong Calvinist. He upholed, opposed liberalism, and when he perceived uh, liberalism coming to the Baptist Union in England, he wrote against it. He called it the downgrade controversy. But as a Calvinist, he certainly uh, preached his invitations um, not in the way a hyper-Calvinist would. He was calling for response. He prayed, Lord, call out your elect and then elect some more. So he preached as if God could uh, add to those who are elect by their response. He was indeed the prince of preachers. Well, looky here. Uh, in 2018, Sweet Thing and I had an opportunity to travel to London, and we went to church at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. What you see here is actually a facade because the tabernacle itself has burnt down a couple of times. The church building behind this facade uh, is much smaller than appearances, but they wanted to at least give the uh, look of the classic metropolitan uh, tabernacle. I will say this was the most international congregation I've ever been a part of. I would say there were 8,900 people there. One third uh, were uh, uh, white, one third were Asian, and another third were uh, African. And uh, so it was, it was a great experience. I was glad to be there. All right, now let's, uh, let's close uh, with our last uh, figure from uh, English church history, uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, he was an atheist and an Oxford professor, but he was converted to faith in Christ over a period of time between 1929 and 1931. Uh, he became a leading Christian apologist and writer of the 20th century. In 1956, he married Joy Davidman Gresham, who died in 1960. You can read their love story in the movie, not read it, you can see it uh, in the movie Shadowlands. This is, this is Margie's uh, favorite movie, maybe, I don't know, but it certainly is a drama, and uh, it's a true story, and it makes us cry every time we see it. Shadowlands, uh, I recommend it. Well... In that same trip uh, to London, we traveled to Oxford, and we got to eat lunch at the Eagle and Child. Uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien were close friends. They met often at the Eagle and Child with other Inklings, this group of, of uh, literary figures. Of course, Tolkien, the author of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, C.S. Lewis, author of the Narnia Chronicles, and so many other writings, they would discuss their literary endeavors. Uh, here is uh, uh, Margie and my sister Lynn who was accompanied us on this trip uh, and there we are in the rabbit room uh, where specifically the Inklings discussed their writings. Well speaking of Lewis's uh, writings they are considerable. The Space Trilogy perhaps is not as well known. He began writing and publishing it in 1939. Nonetheless, it is an interesting allegory of the Christian life. He wrote The Problem of Pain, which is more of an apologetic writing. The Screwtape Letters and The Great Divorce are satirical writings. The Screwtape Letters uh, are uh, demons uh, corresponding with each other about how to foil um, uh, humans from coming to faith in Christ and then uh, from growing as Christians. The Great Divorce is about life after death. He began a series of radio talks uh, on the BBC uh, in 1941 and they were quite effective. 
Today he's probably best known for his Narnia series because of the uh, blockbuster movies that were released recently. But his uh, best known apologetic work is Mere Christianity. Look, that was written the year I was born. Oh my word, I can't believe people are still reading it. But they are, and I guess people are still listening to me uh, since, uh, since y'all are listening to me right now. So maybe 70 isn't all that old. What do you think? Well, uh, this is kind of wraps up just a brief survey of modern European Christianity. You can see we covered quite a bit of ground, but along the way we left out uh, a lot. You will want to be sure that you review all of the names that we looked at today because you will see those names again and be asked to identify them. All right, but more than that, I hope that you've learned a lot about uh, Christianity in modern Europe because even though it's Europe, still has had tremendous influence on Christianity in America and it's had influence on you, whether you know it or not, or perhaps after our study, you recognize the influence that European Christianity has had on global Christianity. All right, well, we are nearly to the end of the semester. We still want to look at modern American Christianity, and that's next. Bye for now.